developing a story just known as Freenas and Trunas. And uh, today I'm, I will be talking about my uh, work during the last couple of years and fancy new features uh, of CTL uh, which were implemented and how CTL can now greatly interoperate with other systems, especially initiators, what it can provide to them, uh, how can it improve all the environment. And so, so let's go. So the f at first, several words about CTL. So, uh, so for those who don't know, CTL can be uh, decoded as CAM target layer. Uh, it's only relation to CAM is uh, in a uh, couple front ends where it starts. Uh, it's front ends uh, to interoperate with CAM subsystem of FreeBSD, uh, which is common uh, access. Uh, it's infrastructure to work with SCSI devices. And here you may see those two front ends, uh, CAM target and CAM seam. One allows to talk to uh, some fiber channel cards, some other target mode cards, and came similos to talk to actually the system itself. But I started something from a side. So uh, CTL uh, core is set of code which allows to emulate SCSI device. Emulated quite good with all fancy details of SCSI, with reservations, with many, many, many features. And on the right side, we can see a bunch of backends where it actually stores the data. So CTL can store data in uh, different block devices uh, represented by Geome. It can store them in the FSZ walls, which is the most advanced configuration in this uh, scheme. And uh, it can also store data in plain files, maybe in UFS, in VFS, on any other file system. But um, again, uh, some more optimization was done for ZFS. And uh, last time, uh, thanks to Edward Napirala, we have another front end for iSCSI. It's presented here. So uh, CTL can work not only as fiber channel target as, as it was before, but now as iSCSI target and potentially could be extended uh, to other kinds of protocols. For example, I'm dreaming about some uh, SAS target, which should not be difficult. All we uh, actually re require for this is uh, driver supporting target mode for, for example, LSI SAS HBAs. And after that, we could do it. But uh, that's kind of small general overview. Uh, and let's start to what actually happened last time. So uh, my topic is called uh, fast and functional uh, target. And in up to from some point, uh, function means faster. And that's the first part of my talk, which I'm going to uh, start. So, uh, so for the first uh, for target to be fast, it should be or convenient for initiator to do things. And target should explain to initiator how to do things efficiently and do it fast. If we start on, if we look on some classic SCSI block device, all it provides is block size, number of blocks, and commands to read them and write them. That worked for who knows many years, 30 years, maybe more. And Below, that's typically what operating system see about disk. It's block size of 512 bytes and a bunch of those blocks. Quite simple. But uh, several years ago, we uh, was hit by such uh, functionality as called as advanced format. When we have disks which have internal structure not rep represented by previous numbers. So we got uh, physical sectors. They are 4K in case of most of modern disks. But there, uh, there was some other cases like 2K and others one. And in fact, uh, those uh, physical box structure 
very closely maps to ZFS functionality. Providing SCSI target on top of ZFS will make it have its own blocks of, for example, 8K, which is default for ZVOL, or even 128K if we do it on top of default data, ZFS data set on top of file on ZFS, or it can be 32K if we're doing SCSI target on top of UFS with default block size. But uh, in all the cases, especially in ZFS, characteristics of those access access is very close to uh, hard disks one. So same as for hard disk, ZFS is unable to read less than one block because it's unable to check uh, its uh, checksum. And same as hard disks can't do can't read less. It has to read all the physical block and then get part of it. For writing, it's even closer. So ZFS cannot write less than one block. So same as hard disk, it must read the whole, whole block, modify some part, and write it back. And in, to avoid those read modify write cycles, which are very expensive, uh, we must in, inform our initiator about what our physical block size. And that's the first thing was added to CTL, uh, which you, you may see here, it's available to initiators. So initiator may now see that target has 8 kilobyte physical block and that it should align all accesses, align partitions and so on to reach performance. So this is example of FreeBSD initiator and FreeBSD default installer uh, should respect this data to align partitions and align uh, some other things. For example, if you create ZFS on top of this disk, ZFS will respect this block size and try to increase a shift up to 8 kilobytes. It's actually maximum size acceptable for ZFS. If you try to, to go higher, ZFS will just drop to its default because it can't go that high. So it depends on specific initiator capabilities, but it's always better to report to initiator what actually we can do to make it efficient. Uh, so now we have some other disks with other geometry specifics, especially some shingle writes and so on. And who knows, maybe at some point, some of them will appear uh, general enough to be reported and so on. So next thing we are seen on the market recently uh, together with uh, appearance of virtualization is uh, SIM provisioning. It's uh, normal for virtual, virtual machines to over-provision CPU, over-provision RAM, but it's also usual to over-provision over -provision storage spaces. So when storage is not needed, it should be returned and can be reused for other purposes. When we are doing some block storage and SCSI storage on top of uh, ZFS, that's clearly obvious because ZFS wants to have more free space available on the pool to reduce uh, free space fragmentation and data fragmentation later. So it's uh, always better to return space back to pool uh, even if, if it's not immediately reused for better health of the pool. And uh, this, is, this goes to another side of resource provisioning we can, which we can uh, actively see in, in the face of uh, solid state drives. drives which want to know which blocks are not used to be able to recycle them in more even pattern to reduce level where of each separate block. And uh, CTL got such support. Uh, so CTL can report that it runs uh, sync provisioning disk. It supports a couple VPD pages. It's logical block provisioning page and block limits page. It can report uh, how big is unmapped block size. And you, for ZFS, it, it matches uh, general physical block size, but uh, technically it could be different. There are some SCSI targets which have a different. And uh, VAI, oh, VMware calls it like another primitive, whatever. It's called uh, VAI Sync Provisioning Reporting. And so that's the first thing CTL got supported. It's quite straightforward. And there are a bunch of other primitives I'll describe later, but this one is first. 
The next thing is, is important is to tell initiator about critical situation when we got out of space, which is quite easy, easy if we are doing storage over provisioning. And doing proper reporting, it's possible to make VMware to detect thi this failure and actually freeze virtual machine and ask what to do. So it's not just a storage error which should crash everything, but it appears uh, such message and ask what to do. Retry after admin administrator free some space or stop virtual machine or and so on. And this feature is called by VMware as VAI in provision in stun. In fact, it's just reporting proper error code, but it's critical for proper integration. And this thing is also supported by CTL. And once we are doing scene provisioning, it's important to be able to actually free some space on a storage uh, which previously was used. Uh, CTL supports all, both two flavors of this functionality. One is uh, through write same command with unmap flag, and another is through unmap command, which is closer alternative to uh, ATA trim command. And uh, VMware calls it VAI, VAI unmap, and here you may see statistics of those commands in ESX top. So it, VMware can actually use it. Windows initiator can use it. FreeBSD initiators can use it. So it's question of better integration. Uh, after we unmap it some blocks, it's possible to actually ask CTL whether those blocks map it or not. Or if it is unmapped, how many other blocks around are mapped to? And here you may see example of how Windows defrag util use that. So it can detect that our disk is seen provisioned and it goes through all disks, checks that all unused blocks are unmapped and reports we have 100% space efficiency. So neither of unused blocks are not counted by storage as, as used. And if it found some block, it calls unmap and freeze them. So usually it, it do, does it in runtime, but if for some reason it didn't happen in runtime, it can fix it later. Uh, also initiator can get statistics about storage space usage. Here we may, we may see uh, logic, logical block provisioning log page reported by uh, st storage which shows how many LBAs we have uh, available on our backend back pool and how many uh, LBAs I actually use it now. And so far I don't know our initiators who would actively use those data, but at least it's possible to get them. It's SG logs, it's standard tool available on Linux and in FreeBSD and it's possible to get these statistics. But what is actually actively used is it possible to set thresholds on those values and make target automatically notify initiator when thresholds are reached. So when system is going close to overflow, uh, we should know it in advance before system will crash and everything will get ba very bad. And so here you may see how VMware uh, reports these kinds of errors. Uh, so you may see you may set threshold like notify me when free space will drop below 20%. And after that, every five minutes, CTL will bug all initiators. Hey, space is going out, going out, blah, blah, blah. And uh, VAI and VMware calls this feature in provision space threshold warning. That's obviously important functionality and it's also supported. And so, the next part of functionality which is important for efficient integration with initiator is IO flow. So some operations uh, done by storage are not necessarily require active interpretation with initiators. So initiator can do, can tell, do something for me please and got off and storage will do it. So uh, there are some functionality which exists in SCSI specifications for ages. Uh, for example, uh, verify command defined science very old SCSI specifications and uh, CTL now also supports that. So you may see uh, here on screenshot how Windows check disk tool checks physical uh, disk for errors. Uh, 
it uses it using verify SCSI command and it's not so critical for regular internal SCSI drives because usually disk speed is much lower than interface speed and you won't get much using verify comparing just a regular read. But when we are talking about iSCSI storages or fiber channel storage, it may happen that storage is actually faster than a connection to the host. And here you may see that Verify does 400 megabytes per second uh, with only 500 kilobytes per second of network traffic. So we're saving network traffic, we're saving, we're increasing bandwidth in case if this is one gigabit link, we're definitely doing five times faster than link could do. And so we are flow completely offloading initiator from, do from pointless work. Uh, the same, alternative to same, uh, could be done for write operation. Uh, so it appears quite useful in case of mm, virtual machines also. When you are creating a new virtual machine and you want to allocate some space to it, you want to pre-erase it, make sure that there is no data leakage and so on. And it's possible to say to virtual machine just er to store it, just erase this please 100 gigabytes or whatever. And that's how it looks in uh, VMware in this sphere. So you, you may see here that 40 gigabytes of storage was erased in 10 seconds. So it's 4 gigabytes per second. And network traffic is just insignificant comparing to, yes? No, verify is just to make sure data is, is are readable. So it just goes through the data and checks that it reads. And on, actually on top of, you no, know, CTL working on top of ZFS, it actually does read and hopes that ZFS will do all its checksums and so on. So it's, it's not actual scrub as, as it could be, but it just read. Right. But the idea is that the drive or whatever is pretending to be a drive mm -hmm. reads the data and checks to make sure that everything is internally consistent. Yeah. But Mm -hmm. uh, but if it's just uh, a straight, set, if it's just a, a study drive by itself, it'll just read the data, do the internal checksums or whatever CRPs that the drive does automatically, and then just store away the data. Yeah. And one uh, more primitive I've skipped, uh, it's called compare and write, it's kind of common, VMware calls it atomic test and set. It's just basic atomic uh, operation primitive, use it in, in most of operating systems, it's a uh, compare and set the same in x86. Uh, it allows to avoid disk reservations for uh, clustered file system access. So it al you can tell it, uh, ch uh, get this data, compare it to data at offset x, and if they match, replace them with data y. And so it's much faster than, uh, than doing it through uh, reservations because it re requires retries and so on. And VMware actually actively uses this feature. And uh, Windows and other clustered in file systems in initiators use it actively. But uh, much more advanced offload can be reached using next primitive. Uh, it also existed in SCSI for ages, but um, was either not very much implemented or not very much used it because it requires and trivial interpretation with file systems. And it again started using together with uh, virtualization and VMware who can uh, move large amounts of data uh, within storage or between storages. And this functionality is, copied, is called XCopy or extended copy. It appeared in SCSI SPC3 quite a lot of years ago and represented by three main copies. Receive, receive copy operating parameters allows to get actual device capabilities whether it support X copy and so on, and with what parameters. X copy command actually can copy data and uh, receive copy status allows to get status for background copy operation. How it actually looks? So uh, initiator can talk to one device and ask it, it, please copy data from offset X on, on some other, maybe other disk Y to offset Z on disk T, and that's maybe many megabytes, gigabytes, whatever, and go. And after completion, uh, notify me when it happened. 
and it actually works. It's used uh, for uh, disk cloning or VM cloning or VM migration in the VMware with here. Here you may see as uh, 40 gigabytes virtual machine uh, move it from one disk to another, 40 gigabytes in 30 seconds, 1.3 gigabytes per second. And network traffic is also not significant. So we are floating initiators, we are floating network, and we are getting much faster operation completion. In fact, what CTL does now at this point, it uh, does a full copy. It reads data from source and writes them to destination. It would be very much interesting to do some more fancy things with ZFS to do something like manual uh, dedupe, like make that data here to, be re to represent that data. So it could be much faster in that case, but it's not very trivial. And at this point, it's just wish to have it. But Microsoft on its side decided this functionality is overcomplicated and they, they decided to reinvent a wheel and actually make it even more complicated. Uh, but they uh, provided, they made own specification, call it as uh, Xcopy Lite or XPC4 Xcopy. Uh, it introduces several new commands and the idea is to split uh, read and write phases of uh, Xcopy operation. So you may s tell, now please uh, create a token of those data. Token is 512 byte of some cryptographically strong hashes and, and some data which represent all those data in, in may, maybe in just in space of disk or maybe even in time. So it can be considered a snapshot of disk. And then uh, when snapshot is created, you may say, okay, and now that other storage and other room, please write to disk X uh, data read from that snapshot, from that token. And that copy may happen in background. And uh, CTL also supports this functionality, also sh so it's limited with uh, only copy operation within one uh, storage host. It's, it doesn't support copying between hosts. And here you may see how Windows 2012 uh, uses this functionality. So you may see 1.47 gigabytes per second copy with clearly insignificant amount of network traffic. So all, all copy operation goes, goes inside storage. Uh, at this point, moment, we, CTL doesn't actually create snapshots. It supports only, uh, only the most simple way of uh, tokens, or sim simple form of tokens, not a point on in time reference, but it could be also implemented later when we found at least some initiator supporting this functionality because Windows at this point doesn't require. And Windows can use it for copying files within a disk, between uh, iSCSI disks of the same target. It can, it's used by uh, win, win Microsoft virtualization software for moving virtual machine, cloning virtual machine, and CTL can efficiently work in that environment. So to su summarize, now CTL supports these three kinds of, uh, these three groups of primitives, uh, VMware VI block, VI thin provisioning, and Microsoft offloaded data transfers. But actually we support more. So here we see a list of commands supported by CTL now, and red commands are which ones were added during the last couple of years. So efficiently we doubled set of supported commands, and now it's uh, not easy to find something in specifications which CTL would not support. But even with all a flawed, there is still a situation where storage actually should do something, <laughs> should read and write something. And that hopefully should, do, should be done uh, fast enough. So CTL also got a bunch of optimizations to improve its performance. Uh, so it got multiple worker threads instead of single ones. It got um, fine-grained locking, it's uh, got per loon and per queue locks instead of big single one. Uh, it's got a number of other optimizations, for example, for, IS for ISCSI and for fiber channel protocols, it can uh, coalesce uh, 
command completion and uh, data transfer completion op uh, operations that allows to reduce number of interrupts or calls to hardware for fiber channel for uh, write operation. You can just reduce from three interrupts to two. So the first interrupt you're getting a request and then you're sending command and second interrupt is just completion and you are done. And so instead of three, so it's like 30% benefits in performance. So it was uh, switched to use Yuma zones instead of own allocator which gives significant benefit because Yuma zones are SMP aware and scale to large systems, or many core systems. Uh, there was many other optimizations uh, for performance, for memory use and everything. And here I have uh, some benchmarks to see what CTL can do now. The first test is, a, uh, is for iSCSI. Uh, I've measured peak uh, IOPS and uh, throughput for different uh, sizes of I operations. I had uh, one target machine with total of uh, 60 gigabits of network connectivity and three initiators with the same pass through, the uh, same throughput uh, limit. I had a bunch of SSDs to back this uh, storage and uh, each of initiators accessed all of the loons uh, in uh, multi-thread li linear read pattern and this is number I've got. So CTL can completely saturate 60 gigabits of traffic and it can do 1.2 million uh, reads per second. Well, for CTL it's quite symmetric, reads or writes, uh, so I haven't explicitly test writes there because it depends on s performance of, ba of backend storage. Uh, ZFS is quite good there too but maybe not as good as on read. In this situation, uh, network cards use it all possible offload. It was Chelsea cards with, a TCP with full TCP offload. So those cards handled all their uh, TCP acknowledges, uh, receive window, everything. And so, but if we take sim uh, less expensive cards without TCP offload and just drop to TCP segmentation and large receive, you may see that we're still doing quite good, but about 20% slower on smaller commands. That's because system has to handle uh, mentioned uh, TCP acts uh, and retransmissions and so on in software, and it creates CPU load, increases CPU load, but also quite, quite good. Uh, if we take uh, more simple network without jumbo frames, you may see that performance doesn't drop so much because it's only slightly because of slightly worse uh, wire usage uh, because of additional headers. But performance is about the same thanks to TSO and LRO of load of cards. So operating system doesn't see much difference from load perspective between previous two cases because either in one case or another packets are going in like 64K blocks at a time. We can, I've tested op opposite case too, so if we have card without any of load at all, but it supports jumbo frames, we are still can be quite good. So reaching almost 60 gigabits of traffic with million IOPS. And if we take cars with no acceleration at all, that probably doesn't exist at such speeds, but still we can do 30 gigabits of traffic with a lot of IOPS, so we are quite good. So this kind of cards usually one gigabit or less 100 megabits and we are probably 10 times faster than it could be possible. So here is a total uh, summary of all cases. So we are quite fast on both IOPS and throughput. You may note that uh, there is still some a gap in between on middle size packets because ideal graph would uh, intersect almost at, at the top. So we are slightly lower, so there is some space for further improvement. And I hope to improve it with later work. Or maybe we mm, soon get some hardware or float from vendors who will close this window also. We'll see. So uh, another set of tests I've made for uh, fiber channel. So it was the same hardware. Uh, systems but I use it dual 8 gigabit uh, Qlogic fiber channel cards. 
So same test, same environment, just replaced one with another. So after all optimizations to uh, ISP driver and uh, CTL related, I was able to reach 160,000 IOPS through two fiber channel ports. I believe that's, uh, that's some kind of limitation of fiber channel cards because the system is not loaded. I, I don't see obvious bottleneck. And while uh, QLogic declares 200,000 IOPS peak throughput of, of each port separately, without having hardware specification, hardware data sheets, it's not obvious how can we reach those numbers. So I would obviously be happy to read the specification to know how to use multi-queuing supported by hardware, how to maybe use some other techniques to improve performance, but 160,000 uh, IOPS is still quite good. Uh, I haven't got full 16 megabits or 16 gigabits, but probably because it's just a difference in measurements uh, because uh, Firewire or Fiber Channel uses 8 bits per 10 bits uh, encapsulation on physical layer. So on throughput side, it should be good enough. So as I've told, there are still a bunch of areas where we could improve things. So it would be good to do some fancy things with XCopy to actually avoid copying, which should be possible for ZFS. It should be cool to support XCopy between hosts, uh, but it requires some other user level interpretation to handle connection between hosts, to, to do discovery of other hosts. It's uh, some bigger project, uh, but which could give benefits for virtual environments and so on. It would be uh, good to recreate uh, high availability clustering, which actually existed in CTL it was before it was open sourced. And so now we have some uh, open hanging code paths in CTL to do this, but it never was recreated on open source world. So it would be good to have. It would be good to improve ZFS prefetch because it doesn't always operate perfectly in case of block storage, especially if you are doing either multi-threaded IO or uh, simultaneously executing several commas to do prefetch. So it's sometimes getting nuts and just either not prefetching anything or prefetching or prefetching things you don't want to. Uh, but there are some workarounds was made to uh, CTL to handle those things as good as possible. And a fiber channel of 3BSD is not uh, full featured comparing to uh, Open Solaris, for example, but there are still things that could be done, that should be done, and uh, I hope to do some work in this area too. So, this kind of talk I would like to head. If there are anybody have questions, I'd like to be happy to answer or comments. What else? Yeah, please. Mm, I haven't tested Chelsea or Iskazio float. I saw, uh, I've tested only with TCP or float. At the point, at the point when I was doing the testing, there was no, uh, I, I had no access to, to Iskazio float code yet. I don't know whether it was officially published. It's somewhere in, in development, and I hope we see one soon. Yeah, but uh, TCP or float does quite a lot of things. Yeah, that's, that's definitely the area I'm going to test, but I haven't done it yet, so we'll see. Questions? Ah, yeah, please. It's uh, even in 10 stable now. So, yeah. It would be cool to, uh, to augment the verify command to be able to actually do like DFS scrub IOs mm -hmm. that make it like read all copies of the data. Yeah. Well, so now it works on top of uh, VFS layer. So we are limited to set of commands uh, which we uh, can do through that layer. 
actually uh, there are there are several backends uh, on top of which CTL can work. It's device, it's Devol and file, and they uh, have slightly different capabilities. So now Devol backend is most functional, we can, where we can do all functionality with support. For example, for file backends, we can't at this moment do unmap because there is no respective uh, call on VFS layer to do unmap uh, on FreeBSD. It's probably only a tiny piece is missing, but we just need to grab somebody uh, who knows all this environment and to implement just a couple functions because VFS can do it, CTL wants to do it, and we need just to have some syscall to do it. No, definitely, ZFS would also benefit from that because now uh, it, it effecti effectively does write, does read, so it allocates some buffer, temporary one, then it does uh, some memory copy from ZFS arc into this buffer and then discards it. So, it, yeah. This uh, again, question of API. We have BO read, BO write, BO delete, but we uh, don't have BO verify or yeah. BO whatever. Yeah. Uh, so, in case of uh, device here, in case of Geom, device we support unmap, but uh, we may not support the other things such as uh, space thresholds and so on because there is no such thing uh, uh, in Geom layer or we can't do uh, some cache control things because again there is no such uh, control bits in Geom, for example, uh, four bit of uh, SCSI force used, forced unit access, which is supported by CTL on top of a file and the wall, but it can't be implemented on top of Geom now. So all these backends are slightly different, and in all cases, we are as close to functionality as possible in specific case. No, but uh, CTL tries to block functionality not supported, so initiator should not be confused in either case. It detects what backend can do and hides unsupported. Any other questions? Thank you for attending. <laughs>